Welcome, welcome, good morning. Thanks for being here this morning. It's my pleasure to um, introduce uh, James Bradley. Some of you may remember that last year, James gave a series, uh, did a, uh, an adult forum series um, uh, on the relationship between the Cherokee Nation and religious faith in general, and then touching specifically upon the ways in which the Episcopal Church in, in engages in, um, with the Cherokee a Nation. Um, James is Cherokee, and James is a newly elected member of our vestry as well, so he will begin his vestry service in January here at Trinity. Um, uh, James got COVID during the middle of that, was not able to continue uh, to finish his last um, uh, presentation. So we're able to welcome James back today to um, kind of finish. And James, we are on kind of what next, right? What yeah. happened from now? Yeah, from now. Okay. I'm going to uh, try to see if I can minimize this. Dave Hensley, you can hear us, right? On the screen. Thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Great. Thank you. I'm going to minimize that so we can see as much as possible. All right. Let us pray. <laughs> Bless us, O Lord, with your blessing. Give us peace on this day. Continue to inspire us to see that you are at work in this world bringing peoples of many tongues and many languages and many nations together around your heavenly throne. Amen. Morning. Thanks, everybody, for coming back. This is like waiting for the last book in the Game of Thrones series. So we came up to, in the last two classes, we were right at uh, removal. So I'm going to do a quick of what happened during removal, and then we'll go forward into more recent issues. Um, in 1828, Andrew Jackson was elected as president of the United States. Ooh. <laughs> uh, that same year, gold was discovered in Dahlonega, Georgia which was at that time under Cherokee territory. And the word Dahlonega in Cherokee is Dalonega, which means yellow. So, you know, gold, that's where that place is. Uh, and that same year, the first issue of the Cherokee Phoenix was published. So um, that was a bilingual newspaper, Cherokee syllabary on one side and English on the other. It was the first and perhaps only uh, native bilingual paper ever in this country. In 1829, Jackson announces the removal policy, and Georgia extended all of its laws over the Cherokee. In 1830, the Indian Removal Act was approved by Congress. In 1830 as well, Georgia laws required residents to swear allegiance to Georgia, which missionaries to the Cherokee refused to do, and they were arrested and imprisoned. In 1832, Wooster versus Georgia, it was a landmark U.S. Supreme Court case, and it upheld Cherokee sovereignty, and, but Georgia defied the Supreme Court's decision and held a lottery for all the Cherokee lands and sub subsequently gave them to all the whites that lived in Georgia. And I think the famous quote from Andrew Jackson when questioned about what his response would be to the Supreme Court's decision, he said, let the Supreme Court enforce it. So, uh, in 1834, Georgia confiscated the Cherokee Phoenix, destroyed the building and the Cherokee typeface, and they declared that it was subversive. In 1835, the Treaty of New Echota was signed by 27 Cherokees, including Major Ridge, John Ridge, Elias Boudinot, and other leaders without tribal consensus. Um, Georgia had actually arrested the chiefs and some of the missionaries and put them in jail. And the federal agent came down and had a big get together and, you know, hey, your white father wants to give you all this money for your land. And so um, some of the Cherokees signed it. They didn't have the authority to sign it, according to tribal law. 
And then in 1835, the U.S. Army made a consensus or made a census of the Cherokees living on tribal land. So every family, all their possessions, um, all that stuff. And part of that was so they would know who needed to be removed. The other part of that was so they would know what to give uh, the people, the white people that were going to take over the farms and the land and stuff and what was going to be there. Um, 1837, the Senate ratified the new Echota Treaty. And it gives two years for the Cherokees to begin removal or complete removal. And federal enrolling agents and appraisers come down um, to assist Georgia with the um, appraising of all the land and stuff. Okay, you can go to the next. Yes. Is there any suggestion that? They thought that the game was up and they, you know, that this was no way they were going to survive this and say, what is it like? Did they block everybody who was in Both. Um, some of them were paid. Uh, the boot not and the ridges were paid yeah. by the government to do that kind of stuff. And since they were the leaders, sort of the community leaders, <laughs> not the elected leaders, people kind of followed what they did. In 1838, the removal begins. May 1st was the roundup, and June 1st, the first detachment of Cherokees left. The other Cherokees were moved into huge stockades, uh, very little food. Uh, was They were incredibly dirty. There were people there selling alcohol, so um, there was a lot of drunkenness. There was a lot of disease, smallpox, dysentery, that kind of thing. Uh, so they held those Cherokees until the beginning of October, when the next detachment of Cherokees left. So this keep in your head, they rounded them up in May and June. So what kind of clothes do they have on? They didn't move them until the winter. They didn't give them new clothes. Yeah, they had to wear what they had on. Uh, it's estimated that this process killed one half to one fourth of the Cherokee nation um, it's hard to get an exact count because they didn't keep track, but there were between four and 8,000 Cherokees that died on the trail. The other, one of the weird things too was the Cherokees going west is where you go when you die, and crossing water is the way you get to the spirit land. So when they got some of the people that went and had to cross the Mississippi with all these boats, they got to the river and they wouldn't get on the boats because it was certain death to them, which happened anyway. And there are three or four different routes. Some of them go up and over. Some no, none of them went directly from uh, Cherokee territory to Oklahoma. They, who the people that were doing the removal, made more money if it took longer. So they went. They came back down. Uh, finally, because of the high mortality rates. The principal chief at that time was John Ross, and he negotiated a contract with the government to remove the remaining 11,000 Cherokee. And the last detachments departed Rattle Spring, Rattlesnake Springs in Tennessee in October and December of 1838. Um, so um, I think I mentioned this before. The Yudani Gadua Band of Cherokee had gone out about 20, uh, 10 years, 10 to 15 years before the removal because they they were, we're going to have to move anyway, we might as well go. So they went out, they had already established a government in, a, in the Indian Territory in Oklahoma. So Cherokee Nation comes out and Yudani Gadua Band says, welcome, you know, we're here and we're set up and Cherokee Nation said, uh, no, we're Cherokee Nation, we'll be in charge. So there was immediate conflict between those two tribes, which continues to this day. Uh, United Gadua Band is uh, more traditional, and they're smaller, like the Eastern Band is here. Um, but they they have a lot more knowledge of culture and uh, history and medicines and those kind of things. So um, there's still friction between those two parties. Yes, sir. I have a quick. That long walk and all those people, I mean, did people escape from the trail up here? Some did. Um, 
Some escaped on the trail and came back to North Carolina. Some made it all the way to Oklahoma and then worked their way back. Um, that's what Dunaluska did. He made it all the way to Oklahoma and then he came back and went back to Graham County. <laughs> so when the the people that signed the treaty of New Echota, once Cherokees got to Oklahoma and got settled, there was a huge assassination. All those guys that signed that were murdered. They were dragged from their homes, murdered in front of their families because giving away Cherokee land without permission and without approval was um, one of the greatest crimes in Cherokee Nation. So they all paid dearly for what they did. In 1843, William Holland Thomas, who was a white uh, man who was raised by Drowning Bear as his son, with funds from the Cherokees, started buying back land in North Carolina. So once again, we have to get our land back. Um, and in the, 18th, in the Civil War, he led a Cherokee contingent that supported the Confederacy. They didn't actually see any action in the Civil War. I think there was a skirmish in Haywood County was about the only thing that happened with him. In 1868, the federal government recognizes all the tribes with whom they've made treaties, including the Eastern Cherokee, as well as Cherokee Nation and United Gadoa Band. And then from 1869 to 1870 was when the Eastern Band organized itself and elected officials. In 1876, the Koala Boundary was formed and the Cherokee lands were secured. Um, if you go to Cherokee, you'll see signs that say Eastern Band Reservation or Reservation of the Eastern Cherokee. We don't actually live on a reservation. That land wasn't given to us by the government, like the tribes out west. We purchased that land and it belongs to us. So what happened was William Holland Thomas, as he got older, started gambling and he started using the deeds for the land that he had purchased for the Cherokee as collateral for his gambling debts. So um, we worked out a deal with the federal government to hold those deeds in trust. So that is still in place today. We can sell land between tribal members. We can't sell land to people outside of the tribe. If you're not a tribal member, you can I can rent you my house and you can live on the reservation, but you cannot purchase any land on the reservation or the boundary. Sorry, see how I do it. Yes, sir. Does the, the Eastern Band own a certain percentage on behalf of the tribe, and then some other percentage is privately owned by enrolled members? Or how, how? Um, the tribal government theoretically owns all the land. They have to approve all land purchases and land trades and building, all that stuff. So they at least, let's say, a McDonald's and we locate there. They yeah. Have the Land. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's been very difficult because we can't offer the land as collateral for loans. Um, First Citizens back in the 2000s finally came up with a plan that allowed Cherokee people to get home loans without using the, the land for collateral. So that's been a whole process of trying to figure out how that would work. Uh, in 1893 to 1948, Cherokee children were forced into federal boarding schools in Cherokee itself, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, in Haskell, Kansas, and Hampton, Virginia. Um, this was not a voluntary thing. This was mandatory. And in some cases, kids were just picked up if they were playing out the orb, they were just picked up by federal agents and sent to boarding school. When they got to boarding school, I'm sure you've all heard the horror stories. Um, they had to have their hair chopped off. The, the theory was kill the Indian, save the man. So they couldn't speak their languages. They couldn't do their dances. They couldn't dress. They couldn't wear beadwork. Um, they couldn't practice any traditional medicines or religions. Um, and these were kids as young as five and six years old. So as these younger kids came in, the older kids that were there were kind of take over and try to take care of them. They would cry at night, of course. Um, some of them never saw their parents again. Some of, a lot of them died at boarding school. Some of them, by the time they got back to their, their homes, their parents were gone. 
Um, so uh, the effects of boarding school were devastating to all tribes across North and South America or North America. Uh, we still feel the effects of that today. Um, in 1916, Cherokee men served in World War I. My grandfather was, in, was one of those. And when the, we weren't even citizens of the United States at the time, but we were allowed to go fight for the United States. But when he came back, he didn't vote. Uh, he didn't have any say in uh, ever. So, okay, Scott, there it is. So this is a headline from Doylestown, Pennsylvania about my grandfather eloping with my grandmother. He was at Carlisle Indian School. Um, he was there from the age of 11. Uh, I'm not really sure he went to fight in the war. And then for a while, I think he was back in Doylestown. Um, he played minor league ball and he worked on the railroad. So this says, a romance that started on the baseball field culminated yesterday when Miss Edith Hart, 16 years old, a sophomore in Doylestown High School and daughter of postmaster Joseph Hart and, and Nicholas Chief Brantley, who was 28, so there was quite a huge age difference, <laughs> eloped to El Elkton, Maryland. A telegram stating, all is okay, we are married, was received by friends yesterday. The bride, the youngest of three daughters, left home yesterday, presumably for school. Instead, she was met by friends who took the young couple to Philadelphia in an automobile where they caught a train to Elkton. Bradley is a graduate of Carlisle Indian School and served overseas in World War I. So about every 10 years, the Doylestown newspaper would come down and do a story on uh, my grandparents, where they were. And they ended up having nine kids, and he became a preacher. And, and so. And we all still live on that land. That's my grandfather. Answer. And that's um, my grandmother and my grandfather. Um, this was one of the huge family dinners we used to have. That house is still standing. My mother actually lives in that house now, my sister. Uh, it was built in 1935. So that's our home place. Okay, go ahead. And just to be fair to the other side of the family, this is my maternal great-grandmother. Her name was Polly Graybeard. Um, we also have a family of mumbleheads in our family on that side. Uh, she was the daughter of Johnson and Sarah Graybeard. She married my grandfather, Riley Ledford, and gave birth to my grandfather, Moses. She only spoke Cherokee. Um, so because of boarding school, my grandfather, on my mom's side, I only spoke Cherokee until he had to go to boarding school. And he, most of the people that went to boarding school didn't teach their children the language. So that's where the loss of our language began because they didn't want what happened to them to happen to their kids. I'm going to zip through this pretty fast. In 1924, I'm oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. That's good right there. Uh, the Baker Roll was established by the government in preparation for land allotments. And this is the role that we use for the basis of our citizenship in Cherokee now, in Eastern Cherokee. You have to be able to trace your lineage back to somebody who was on the Baker Roll. In 1930, EBCI members became citizens of North Carolina. Um, in 1946, EBCI members were allowed to register to vote in North Carolina. So that was 16 years later before we were even allowed to vote in this state. In 1946, the Call of Arts and Crafts was established. I'll go over all more of this in a minute. 1952, the Call of Housing a board was established to provide low-cost loans for housing for uh, tribal members. And my parents actually got our new house, we call it the new house, it was built in the 70s, um, through that loan. And at that time, it, we had to do what was called sweat equity. So everybody in the family had to go nail uh, trusses together and 
uh, do all kinds of work like that, and that help pay part of your loan for the house. Um, in 1988, the Indian Gaming Act was passed by Congress, which opened, which allowed um, tribal nations to have gaming on tribal lands. In 1990, the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act guarantees protection for remains of Native peoples and their reburial by their people. So anytime there's construction, we have a uh, an office that handles this through the uh, history office in Cherokee. So anytime there's construction and they find graves or they find artifacts, that team has to go out and assess. And if there are in fact remains, um, they have to be re removed or they can be removed. They don't always have to be removed and then brought to tribal lands and reburied. In 97, we opened Harris Cherokee Smoky Mountain Casino. And in 1997 as well, we made our first land purchase, which I talked about earlier. We bought Gadua, the mother town site back, and it came back into the tribe. In 2007, we purchased Cowee Mound. And in 2013, we bought Halls Mountain, which is the land adjacent to Cowee Mound. Uh, and in 2013, we broke ground on our second casino in Cherokee County uh, in Murphy. So go to the next slide, mm -hmm. please. So we covered parts of eight states when DeSoto first came through, when there was first contact with Europeans. This is what we have now. And these little places down here in Cherokee County, Graham County, we have 56,000 contigu non-contiguous acres um, in this part of North Carolina. And the this biggest part is where Cherokee, the city, is with the museum and all that stuff. Um, these would have been different townships in the past. The, the people down here in Graham County and Cherokee County tend to be more traditional. Most of our speakers um, come from this area and also from the Big Hope area in, in up here in Cherokee. Can you yes. say, yes. I, as I read, it's Cherokee County down there, but that's really Graham County, is that what you're saying? Cherokee County's right there, Graham County's right here, so okay. we have land uh, okay. in both of those. Most of what we have in Graham County's near Robbinsville and in Snowbird. Okay, Scott. Why is the, res the reservation from the government so small? We're out in Oklahoma, the enormous. Why did they give so little land? Um, because we had to purchase that land. Like I said earlier, they didn't give it to us. So we had to purchase land. All of the 1830s in North Carolina, yes. They didn't give us any of that land. So everything that you see on there is land that we bought back two or three times. <laughs> this is Gadua. Um, it's really hard to find a picture that shows how large this space is. Um, this is where the mound would be. And I think I said, I do these talks so much now, I forget who I told what. But the mound would have been gigantic with, if you don't know, Gadua is where Cherokees came from. That's in our histories, our oral histories. This was the first village that was considered Cherokee. This is where the clan system started. and. Um, so it was really important for us to have this back in, in tribal hands. Um, the mound would have been used for a council house, and it would have been seven-sided so that um, each clan had its own section to sit in. There were several hundred people here. I don't know the exact count. There were 14 different communities over the years on this property. Um, the mound lasted until the 50s, 1950s. The family that owned it were farmers. And what was, of course, it would have degraded, but it was still pretty much a mound. So that family took their tractor with their disc and went around and around and around and knocked the mound down. Um, there were bones of, that's where the medicine men and beloved women would have been buried within that mound. Um, there were bones that came out. So it survived that long. Uh, if we could have just gotten it a little bit sooner, we could have saved that. Um, the last village in Gadua was destroyed um, in the 17, like 75, 76. 
um, it was just, oh, what's that man's name? You see signs all over. What? Rutherford. Rutherford, yeah, Rutherford Trace. He and his men um, destroyed, burnt down. This was in the late summer, early fall. They burnt down all the crops, burnt down all the houses, not just this village, but all the villages in North Carolina and some in South Carolina or Georgia, I think. So anyway, um, one of the soldiers in his memoir wrote, the only thing that was left were the footprints of kids running through the burnt corn. Oh. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. In purchasing land, I, was that a, what kind of negotiation was it? Were the, were the sellers gracious or were they? Yes. They actually um, approached, Joyce Dugan was the chief at that time, and they approached uh, Chief Dugan because their family was going to, they were all old and the kids had moved away and nobody was going to be there to form it. They really felt that it needed to be back in Cherokee possession. So they approached Chief Dugan and Tribal Council. And when we purchased it, it was just like any land purchase. You know, we paid for it. We had to pay state taxes on it. Um, so, but recently, within, gosh, the last three years, maybe, there's a process that tribes can do when we purchase land like that to bring that in to the rest of the land that is the tribes. And so that was done with Kadua about three years ago. So that's our land. We don't, it's not the state's property anymore. Yes, ma'am. In that area, I just heard some cases. Yes, um, there are tribal members that are on those boards or on those committees uh, that kind of lead that. And a lot of, sometimes we get pushed back, for, but for the most part, the towns around us are very helpful and open to, and some places like we bought Howie Mound, but Nkwasi, we oversee. It, that's our, we made an agreement with that town that we oversee that and it's our responsibility to take care of it so that there's no development there. So there's different ways that the tribe works with the communities around us to protect that those sites. That was a good question, yes. Speak up a little bit, please. Okay, and I'm curious about your experience of being on this and then specific. About the reciprocity or the commitment that you or the, the Cherokee share as a, a spiritual or a traditional is that recognizing what it's been through because that's something I was just learning in her stories that the tribe has a natural resources office, um, and it's both tribal members and non tribal members that work to protect and implement Cherokee traditional ideas for land management uh, as a way to teach people um, involving, you know, the school systems and that kind of thing. They have um, people that come from colleges that work with them and, and all that. Um, for me personally, the land we're on, my grandfather purchased and now I have fourth and fifth cousins that live on that same land. Like we all live in, and it's very, uh, very normal in Cherokee that everybody, the extended family all lives in, in the same areas. So we're back, we're back and forth and in and out of each other's houses. We all farm together. Um, the men hunt, not me, but the other men, <laughs> they hunt, um, we share that food. We're, we're careful about how much, how many animals we take. Some of that's North Carolina laws and some of that's tribal laws. So there's still that whole, you know, every fall we all get together and plant potatoes. I mean, every spring, then every fall we all get together and we call it digging taters, taking the taters out of the ground and putting them in storage. And that's a whole big family thing. Like everybody comes and it's, it's not just 
preparing for the winter is part of that, but it's a whole family tradition. And you see families all over the reservation, the boundary doing that. Um, so a lot of that stuff is still alive. And some of the things that we've been working on lately are uh, working with the Chestnut Foundation to replenish American chestnut trees, um, providing more materials for artists, uh, like raising river cane and white oak and you know those kind of things so that those artists always have that material available to them. So those are the kind of things that we're working on. Let's see, where are we? Okay, this is a stickball. I think I talked about this before as well. It was called the Little Brother of War. It's, very, it's what lacrosse uh, came from. There's no, see these guys here, they have on shorts, that's it. You, there are two branches at one end and two branches at the other end and there's a ball. And you have to scoop the ball up with the hand with the sticks. Once you pick it up, you can throw it, but you can't touch, you can't pick it up from the ground with your hand. The, basically, the only rule is you have to get your ball to the other end and score. There's no, it's rough. <laughs> Picking and a lot of times tribes or villages, instead of actually going to war, would play stick ball with each other to see uh, who who would win. So um, we still officials and referees. There are these guys called whippers, and they have big long branches. And guys tend to wrestle and end up in big piles, which stops the game. And so those guys go over there with those things and whip everybody until they get up and start playing again. Every year at uh, in October when we have Cherokee Fair. Every community has a team, so that's that's a big deal too. Everybody goes to stick ball. Well, they televise it on the local cable station, and we have announcers. And this year, we even had a team from Cherokee Nation come out and play. <clears throat> you can go forward, Scott. This is more modern day. This is how the game starts. Everybody's around the circle, and that's the stick ball. It's thrown up in the air, and they go after it. So next. Oh, my. This was from this past October. So this guy's being choked. This guy's the ball. You can hit people with your sticks too. Next. So this guy's being tackled while biting this guy on the knee. He's, he's holding this. This is probably a guy that can run really fast. So the big guy's knocked him down, so he can't get the ball and run. Um, that's actually my cousin. This this was a former tribal council member. <laughs> okay. Um, he got hit so hard his headband. Yeah. What did you say? Headband came off. He was hit so that hard. Banner right there. He got knocked and it blew up in the air. I believe that's also my cousin. And then, um, this was from Anthony's Hills. I must have messed up the pictures, but had a picture of the, uh, the theater. That show opened in 1950, and it still runs today, so it's in 70-something years old. Um, this was in 1989, and this is the only tribal member to ever be the lead eagle dancer of the show. And his name is James Bradley or something like that. <laughs> that was me in another life. Next. James, there wasn't any other tribal longer that. The original intent when the historical association was formed was to bring people outside of the tribe, dancers and um, script writers and directors and things like that and have them work with tribal members and teach us how to do a show so we could take over it. And that just never happened. It became a playground for, and there were great people from uh, Chapel Hill to come up every summer. Um, and there's a thing called AC Southeastern Theater Conference that auditions are every spring. And so the staff would go there and get dancers and actors to fill the roles and then Cherokee people were like the stage dressing. We did, we very rarely had speaking roles. So when 
uh, we took over the show in 2005. Uh, that changed. We brought in Hanae Gigama. I don't know if any of you know the Native American Dance Theater, but Hanae is a professor at UCLA. He's a Native American. He brought an entire Native American production staff. The, the entire staff or the cast was 98% Native American and 83% Caribbean. Yeah, so 60 something years later, we finally kind of got on that path of training people. Yes, sir. How is the reestablishment of the language going? I'll get to that in just oh, a second. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It was very Ten Commandments from the 50s up until 2006. Very, you know, narrator telling you everything that's happened in, oh, the poor Indians, look how mean we were to them. Um, in 2006, we got, uh, Hanay wrote the new script. And so the idea for that story was the seven clan spirits got together and instructed the tribe to do a, a new dance. So in that process, we, the guy that did all the costumes worked on Broadway. He's also Native American. He did Wicked and, um, other shows like that. Um, so in this process, the musician or the musical director was Seneca in New York. And they came down and spent a lot of time with elders and studied culture and decided, you know, got permission for what they could put in the show. But the musical director took all of our, the bear dance, uh, what else did we do? The horse dance, the, the morning song, and he wrote all of those down on um, like sheet music. So now we have copies of our music that we keep in the museum that no matter what happens, we'll always have somebody can figure out how these how these songs went. And the horse dance was really cool because it has three different sections. And he piled them on top of each other just to see what would happen. And they all harmonize with each other. So, so that was really cool. But um, so that show was more like a legend, and then they changed it after that, and I think they've gone back to the original script. Um, it's really, outdoor drama in America is really struggling, so it's not the big deal that it used to be. Um, this is Harris Casino Resort, which allows us to buy land. This was, the Godua purchase was the first thing we did. This is after two or three expansions. Originally, it was probably this little area right here. It was only 60,000 square feet of gaming space. There were two little restaurants in there, no hotels. Um, there was a kind of an entertainment venue, but not really. When Joyce Dugan was chief, she went up right before opening. I was working on her staff, and she came back to her office, and she was polite, and she was just like, and I said, Chief, what's the matter? And she said, they're moving money around on pallets with forklifts up there. <laughs> oh my God, what have we done? Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, what do you mean? She goes, what if nobody comes? What if this is a, what have we done? But fortunately for us, because of all those other things, the museums and other things like that, we were already a tourist destination. And so I think that helped us um, kind of tap into that. So, um, it opened the first day, they had to shut the doors because they ran out of money and, it, it, you know, fortunately, thank God, it's been very um, helpful for the tribe. Um, whatever your personal feelings are about gambling, it's been really fantastic for the tribe. So this is the first expansion that happened and we added hotel rooms and we added a big entertainment mm -hmm. venue and it's been growing. Of course now, and I, I thought this 20 years ago, we need to not tell people how successful this is being because <laughs> now Atlanta's going to do one and they're in Tennessee and Virginia's doing them. And so, um, rightfully so, everybody should have economic development. But, you know, this is, we're going to have to figure out what we can do to make up for any losses that happen because we haven't had any competition. Our closest competition is Las Vegas. Wow. Okay, next. Let's see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> This is what the casino looks like now. Wow. These are the hotels. That's the original building. This is the convention center hotel. This is the entertainment complex. This is the parking deck. And that's the special event, events in the convention center. 
So, and also we financed all this ourselves. We didn't, we didn't get any help from anybody. The tribe, you know, went through this whole process of uh, finding the funding for this. But in 2012-ish, 2010, we had been trying to, Indian Gaming Works, each tribe has to have a gaming compact with their state. And the state kind of decides what kind of games you can have. So we'd been asking for uh, live dealers. We, we didn't have those when we first opened. It was all just slots. And so to make that deal happen, the governor requires that we pay the state $8 million. We gift the state $8 million every year for the state to use for education. So even though the state has nothing to do with any of this, we have to give that money to, to have some of the games. Yes. I mean, this is good to Well, we didn't do some medical reporters. People go to India and Mexico. And I've been thinking that uh, all boundaries kind of poised to do an integrative approach. And I don't know if that's anything that they would spoke. It is. Um, that's part of the whole economic development post gaming. What are we going to do? That new Bucky's that opened outside of Sevierville, that's our land, but that sits on. We bought that, the whole big track right there. And there's some other stuff that's going to go over there. So we're trying to not put everything in Cherokee, um, but have other ways. And the cannabis project is one of those things where they're working out. in the trunk, you know, of the indigenous period. And so I we don't share a lot of them. We don't I don't know what sorry. I don't know what other tribes do, but we don't share a lot of our outside of the trunk. Next. <laughs> this is the new hospital that we built. Um this he is the here. Yeah. The treatment is beautiful on the inside. And uh, so that's been um, some of the amazing things that have happened because of gaming. Um, the way gaming works, the Harris takes off their, their part of it, which is not as much as it used to be. And then anything that's left as profit is divided in half, and half goes to tribal government for tribal programs. The other half goes to tribal members as dividend payments basically since we own the casino we own it as a tribe so any profits are divided between all of us yes it used to be but we contacted the hospital in 1986 i believe so we've been in charge of our own hospital since then um we if kids are going back to per capita gambling payments. If kids are under 18, it goes into an investment fund. And when they're 18, when it first started, kids got all their money when they turned 18. And what we were finding is a lot of kids, because we've never had that kind of money, um, were blowing it, buying expensive vehicles they couldn't take care of. Uh, it was affecting the workforce. It was affecting college attendance. So we have what's called the Juneau Alaska Leadership Council. And that's all high school kids. They get together and meet just like tribal council and they come up with ideas that affect youth and they vote on which ones they want to bring to actual tribal council. So they came up with the idea of splitting payments, 18, 21, and 25. So you get a third and a third and then whatever you left, hoping that that would prevent a lot of the things that the problems that were going on um, they have to complete a financial literacy course before they can access their money. They have to graduate from high school before they can access their money or get a GED. Um, so there are some stipulations. And there's a financial literacy curriculum in the school system now uh, to hopefully help teach these kids how to handle this money. Okay, next. So this is the... Where is the Cherokee Indian Hospital located? It is... 
on a hill right out right by downtown. Um, if, downtown where? Uh, Cherokee. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. So this is the entrance to the hospital, and it was designed to look like a basket. <laughs> so there are little design things like that throughout the hospital. Okay. This is our school system. We call it the new school system, even though it's about 20 years old now. Uh, we traded land with the National Park. We gave them land in Big Cove, the remote part of the uh, boundary. Mm -hmm. And they gave us this. There was a like year, year and a half long excavation. This was a uh, site of several Cherokee villages as well. So all those artifacts are in storage and we're building um, an archive for all of those things. Go ahead, Scott. Oops. That's just, there's basket patterns on the building. Um, it's, I forgot what the certification is, but it's a green building. There's a marsh nearby that um, the science classes use to study wetland preservation. So this is the overview. Remember I told you the council houses were seven-sided? The elementary school is seven-sided. So middle and high school is seven-sided. So, and they have, there's a, there's a building that they meet in outside that has the garage doors on that they can open and close that seven-sided. Okay, next. This is the Nugadua Language Academy, uh, preschool through sixth grade. Uh, preschool through third grade is all Cherokee. And then from three to sixth grade, they, of course, the kids speak English as well, because that's what we speak of. But um, this was the former Boundary Tree Hotel that the tribe owned, and it went under when I was younger. And so they repurposed it into the language academy. And the we also run our own school system, the, the school buildings that I showed you. There are also language programs there from the first grade through 12th grade and Cherokee history. Next. That's another shot. This is Shaylu, the corn mother. Next. So this is a hallway <laughs> in there's a an entrance like at Esther's. This is the hallway to the classrooms. And that's the sign that's that's above the door. It's really difficult to produce fluent speakers because if you don't hear the language at home, it's hard to keep that in your head. <laughs> we do, I think we're down to about 170 first language speakers now. And that number dwindles because of course they're older. Uh, Cherokee Nation has produced a fluent speaker, and there's a there's mm -hmm. a process for that. They have to be able to converse with first language speakers. And, and Cherokee is a difficult language to learn. There's 14 different verb tenses, so it's really hard. But my my great nieces are in kindergarten and second grade, and they can speak. They come home. Singing in Cherokee and counting in Cherokee and asking me why I can't understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. a, we have a, a great, yeah, we have a great relationship with Western. Um, several years, a couple, well, it's not been that long maybe less than five years ago, all, we have tri-council every year where all the tribes come back together, all three Cherokee tribe meet at Red Clay, which is where the tribe was last united as one tribe prior to removal. So every year, um, we it moves actually from tribe to tribe, but that's where it started. So they, all tribes declared Cherokee language um, um, in dire need of rescue. That's not the official title, but that's what comes to my head. So all of us are working jointly to share lesson plans and history and resources and teachers and things like that to try to save the language. And if you ever come to Cherokee, you notice on the, the street signs and a lot of the building signs, there's Cherokee syllabary on top and then English on the bottom. It's just a way to kind of expose people to the syllabary. Okay, next. 
that's my mom and dad. I just put that on there. <laughs> that was a house one of his brothers built, but it's on our land. And he he was a wood carver, and mom finishes finished all his wood, like sanding it and putting lacquer and stuff on it. So whenever he would go to that, to, we called it the shop, but she called it his pouting house. So whenever he wanted to pout, he would go up there, <laughs> get him up from there. So they they were amazing. When I was learning to play piano in seventh grade, my piano teacher told my parents, "He's he has a talent for this, and if you have a corner in your home where you can put a piano, you should get one for him." So they found a piano. This woman was selling one in silver, seven hundred dollars. They carved out seven hundred dollars worth of carvings and sold them, and took that money and bought me a piano. Oh. Yeah, which I still have in my house today. Okay, that's it. Ski, thank you. <laughs> yes. Are there organized tours that you can take of the Cherokee Nation out there? That you can take a tour and they explain things to you? Not, not no. really. We had, we tried that in the early 2000s with Step On Guides, um, but I think that program kind of fell apart. In the summertime, there are Cherokee ambassadors. So if you go to the museum, you'll see people dressed in traditional 1750s Cherokee. And you can talk to them and they can tell you a lot. But um, the museum and the Indian Village and the Unto These Hills Theater are all right there, kind of in the same place. The Kuala Arts and Crafts is there as well. Um, the museum may be able to help you with that. I don't know. They have a new director now and they're really expanding what they do. So they may be um, able to provide someone that can take you to like the do well and explain it. Thank you. Friends, thank you. keep on asking questions, but it is 1030. Okay. So I want to acknowledge that. I'm going to turn off the Zoom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.